This image in front of you is a witness from one of the top scientists in the history of humanity. His name was Pierre Curie, uh, who was awarded with his wife, Mary, the Nobel Peace Prize 1903. And this was his statement as a witness, if we could have not burned the Muslim books, it means in Andalusia, we would have been already traveling between galaxies. I'm not going to talk about him now, but his introduction will come later on in, the, in, my, uh, in my talk. Uh, why I use the verse in the Quran from Surah Yusuf? Because he was saved by the witness of the little suckling babies, baby who protected him uh, protected his dignity and his integrity and Allah let this little baby to speak about the credibility and the integrity of Prophet Yusuf when the woman was trying to accuse him of attacking her. I need to uh, thank my two colleagues, Ahmad Sheikh on the left and uh, Ali Shawa on the right, who have been helping me uh, to uh, bring this material together. And as you can see, I believe in youth, I rely on youth, I help youth, and youth help me, or young people help me. I hope that in the future, we'll have some young ladies to help me as well. This is the index of my talk for today. Please bear with me for this coming half an hour or 40 minutes, please, 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 because there's a lot of references. And they'll ask Ali Shawa now to put another, to add another link about another talk which I gave uh, two years ago. It called, Money Does Not Get You a Status. Ali, please add this link to the two presentation on the Facebook and money does not get you a status. No matter how much money you spend, you will not be credible in your society. You will not make a history. You will not make a change. Money does not give you a sense. Please listen to the other talk, which Ali is going to share its link with uh, the talk today. Plus, there's a lot of references being, being actually collected by Ahmad Shawa and Ali as well. Seven points to talk about. Point number one, let us go to the introduction. How the Arabs in the good old days at the time of the Prophet, even before the time of the Prophet, when they were trading between Sham, which is a Roman area, Persia, as well as others, started to believe in speaking different language or understanding different languages. Now we're talking about how the Arabs understood the value of translation from the Greek into the Arab language. The movement of translation from Greek to Arabic language was spreading widely at the later part of Umayyad. Whenever we talk about Umayyad dynasty or uh, Abbasid dynasty, we talk about war, we talk about conflict, we talk about uh, politics, we talk about army, we talk about leadership. We never talked about the Umayyad role in building civilization for humanity or the Abbasid role building civilization for humanity. So it started the process of translation from Greek into Arabic language at the time of the Umayyad, then it went to the Abbasid time. Many books on astronomy, medicine, philosophy, mathematics were translated to the Arabic language. This movement was comprehensive. It was not just ad hoc like nowadays. It was a system inside the state of the Umayyad or the state of the Abbasid to bring this knowledge, knowledge transfer, technology transfer to their actually uh, state and people. In Baghdad, the translation movement was noticeable from mid eight centuries, eight centuries, eight centuries, actually to the end of the 10th century, the translation. 
Also, through this period of translation movement, already translated many books from different language, not only from the Greek, from the Bahlawi, from San San uh, Sanskrit, Syriac, and the Greek languages. Not only they did not actually translate only the Greek, but other languages, other because they were looking for the origin of civilization and Renaissance at that time, the Abbasid. This is because of it, it focused on translating Hellenistic scholar books. Yani a, lot of, a lot of achievement has happened before the Muslim, before Islam came, from Hellenistic scholar books, manuscript, and all the Greek textbooks into Arabic language. This was technology transfer, knowledge transfer, believed by the state in the Abbasi and in the Umayyad uh, state at the time. At the time, there was no established structural system to write the Arabic language. But Arabs managed to learn other languages. Why? Because of the trade. You know, the caravan of the summer, the caravan of winter, which have been mentioned in the Quran. So for the business-wise, Arabs started before Islam to learn other language because of the trade. Uh, this was the time where and when the Syriac people changed their traditional culture, customs, and values into Arabic language. Then Islam came, and Islam came with the last and most visionary messenger of God, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who started to write to many political leaders in their own different languages, not in Arabic language, in their, in their own language, in Persian, in Roman, in Byzantine, everything. And he encouraged his followers to speak different languages. That's why Zayd ibn Sabit spoke three languages, Hebrew, uh, Roman, and Persian language. So this is from the, from the inception of the Islam in the, in the, in, in the, in the, in the Meccan, and in, in, in the Medina time, especially in the Medina time when the, when the Hudaybiyah Treaty was established and they started to communicate with other leaders globally to send the message and the messenger of Islam to these countries in their own local language. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died in the middle of the 7th century, 632. And at that time, there was a new phenomenon, a new fashion, a culture, new culture in the different, in the neighboring civilizations that they want to know more about Quran. They want to know more about a Islam. They want to know more about the Arab as well. That's what becomes fashionable after the death of the Prophet in 632. The expansion of the Islamic empire led to the finding out or creating teachers. At that time in the Umayyad, as well as in the Abbasid dynasty, even in the second part, in the time of Khalifa Omar and uh, Abu Bakr, uh, not Abu Bakr, uh, Omar and Uthman, they were trying to find Arabic teachers or teachers who speak Arabic and speak other languages, especially in the Umayyad as well as in the Abbasid uh, dynasty, because of the expansion, because of the expansion of the kingdom of Islam at that time. Uh, Umayyad dynasty started from 661 to 750, it's more than one century. The Syriac and Syriac language was the prime factor leading to what? To translating into Arabic materials from the Greek, because Arab did not know the Greek language. Because many Arab did not understand the Greek language, while Syriac managed to understand the Greek language 14th century. So the Syriac people actually translated uh, 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 the, uh, uh, from the, the Syriac into the Arabic language. During the time of the fourth Umayyad Caliph, which is Marwan ibn Abdul Hakam, uh, they were started to translate other things, become like a state now, a new state, actually, in the middle of the Umayyad uh, dynasty. Uh, actually, started translating uh, the official document, the state have an official document treaties, uh, promises, uh, and as, plus other sciences like astronomy and other sciences as well. So it's not only the scientific knowledge, but it's also the social and the political uh, uh, paper that need to be translated at the time of the Umayyad 
dynasty. Also, during this time, I'm, I'm just keep repeating this in, in, in a longer discussion because I'm telling myself and everyone listening to me today is actually Umayyad and the Abbasi dynasty were not about conflict, were not about power of, uh, uh, of, of ruling. It was actually built, both of them were building civilization and they already built civilization when Europe could not be able to stand up for looking at the Renaissance of the Arab, actually during the Middle East time and suffering from the Inquisition, which is created to them by the church. Also, they translated Byzantine and Persian songs and poetry, not only scientific, uh, were translated into Arabic, as well as ancient Greek texts like in philosophy, Aristotle uh, writings and translated also to Arabic language. This impacted what? The Arabic poetry. It has some, some, some flavor of the Greek uh, uh, philosophy or the Greek uh, rhyming. Uh, the beginning of the serious Greek Arabic translation was where at the time of the Abbasi, the Abbasiyin. But the Umayyad started before the Umayyad, the Prophet ﷺ gave the go ahead. With the expansion of the Umayyad empire, and because of the increasing number of Arabic conquests in Asia, Persia, North and East Africa, this has happened there at the time of the Umayyad. This led to the lay down of a foundation of a civilization, a new civilization, able to increase Greek Arabic translation. That means that the state itself, what was strong, believed in education and believed in knowledge transfer and believed in technology transfer and believed in cultural transfer and believed in value transfer. Don't ever, never, to talk about those people in a bad way. They believed that, about that in the uh, seventh century and eighth century, nearly six, 60, uh, 14, uh, 15, uh, no, no, 14 centuries ago, or 13 centuries ago. We're still in the Maya time, this vast Arabic conquering managed to what? to unite those small tribes and small groups of people and societies and uh, 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 together under the Islamic empire, connecting the isolated marginalized nations and societies, activating the trade and the agricultural routes and improving the economy of the state as well as the economy of the individual. Economy of the state, and the economy of the individual, not only economy of the states, economy of the states has to be managed by the uh, economy of the individual himself or herself. The regional stability during the Umayyad era led to the increasing, uh, increasing the rate of literacy. Of course, people have money, people have stability because peace and security. So the literacy was on the rise amongst, uh, the, not like nowadays, People are making their own citizen poor. They are not investing in education or learning or technology or research. 1300 years ago, they were actually investing in literacy, knowledge transfer, technology transfer, as well as translation. Increasing the rate of literacy among the citizens, which led to the foundation of laying down the design of the structure of education system. Education becomes a system, a process, not only just haphazardly done as it was in the past. This also led to accommodating whom? Those minorities. Accommodating and absorbing the Syriac and Hellenistic speaking Christian groups in Persian Iraq and Persian Iran into the state structure itself, not only become citizen, but became a part of the state structure itself. Tell the people nowadays, what do you mean by integration? Integration means that actually you respect the people who are living with you 
and let them to have their own religion, their own culture, their own value, and, become, and make them a part of the structure of the state. Not assimilation, as people are trying to make us nowadays. Accommodating the Hellenistic was decisive in increasing the state interest in the Greek secular educational system. See all this? Know your history. Please read your history. Please understand your history. Please comprehend your history. We move from the uh, Umayyad uh, dynasty into the Abbasi, which started from nearly five centuries, one century of building Renaissance and the civilization in, 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 in Sham, in, in Damascus, then followed by another five centuries in uh, uh, Baghdad, in Iraq, nowadays. The Abbasi Khalifa, Harun uh, Rashid, uh, built the library of Baghdad. It's not, it's not a war between Al Bayt and others. Like nowadays, people trying to divide, to increase the rift, increase the divide between Sunni and Shia. No, it was not. It was not. He built himself, uh, Harun Rashid, uh, uh, Baghdad Library, then his son, Al uh, Ma'mun, carried on as well. Then all the, the, all the Abbasi. Uh, uh, Khalifa were actually investing heavily in building library, building uh, houses of wisdom, building scholarity, scholarships, and all these sort of things. The number of precious books in the libraries were in millions in Baghdad, in millions, believing in Renaissance and civilization and transfer of technology and transfer of knowledge. The translation movement was spreading and uh, progressing during the Abbasid era as well. This concluded, this included the religious text. So now they started to translate the meaning of Quran into different languages to enable the non-Arabic speakers to understand the meaning of Quran. The translation movement facilitated civilization overlapping. Greek, then Arabs. Greek, then Arabs. Greeks and Arabs, then from Arabs to the Andalusian. The translation movement facilitated civilization overlapping and the emergence of new culture and political system, developing the new scientific knowledge seeking system among the Arabs. They used to call about the Arabs are actually barbaric, savage, whatever. No, this is, a, this is the reality. Because if they were that, they could not have built this civilization in Baghdad at that time. Translation movements facilitated civilization overlapping and the emergence of new cultures and political system, developing the new scientific knowledge seeking system among the Arabs. Then afterwards, the Western culture was introduced to the Arabic culture. The fall of Baghdad, as well still. It fall in 1252, Mongol went there. They were surrounding Baghdad for about 12 days. But when it fall, unfortunately, for 40 days, the Mongol were killing people mercilessly, burning everything, raising Baghdad and its treasures and building, historical building, يعني, everything into the ground, throwing millions of books in the Tigray River. And we thought that they were carrying these books to take it back to their uh, capital, uh, Karakum. No, they were just throwing them into uh, the middle of the river because they were not civilization builder. They did not believe in, uh, in, in, in knowledge transfer, technology transfer. They were anti-humanity and anti-civilization and anti-renaissance and anti-being and anti-existence. The historian said about the number of people killed in Baghdad between 800,000, one historian somebody said 1.8 million, and others said 2 million. It doesn't matter how many were killed, but it matters that the history talked about this big number of people being killed nearly uh, seven centuries ago. So you can imagine how crowded this area was. And this was what, but why? because of a, a, a bad minister who was the informer for, for, for Hulaku and his army 
to come and invade Baghdad and was advising the king at the time or the Khalifa at the time to reduce the number of the army officers and the soldiers to 10,000 while the number of the Mughal army soldier was actually 200,000. His name was Ibn al-Qami, which is the bad minister who stabbed the Khalifa in his back. We moved from the Baghdad, you took, we talked about the introduction, then we talked about the, uh, uh, the fall of Baghdad, and now we're going to the west, far west in Andalusia, which is the Muslims, can you bring the slide down, because I cannot see the top writing, um, uh, Ali. Can you bring the slide down, please? Can you hear me? And can you remove this uh, box, the black box from the writing, please? Put it somewhere else in the bottom, at the bottom. Hello? Hello? Islamic Caliphate uh, lasted in Andalusia for nearly eight centuries, 781 years. 700, it will tell it fall down on 14, this, uh, November 1491. Ali, can you please remove this box in the middle and move it because I cannot read the, the dates. Okay. So Granada fall in 25th uh, Muharram 897 Hijri or uh, I think February, uh, no, November, uh, in, in 1491. Abu, Abu Abdullah Sagir surrendered Granada to King Fernando and he made a treaty with him that King Fernando and his wife Isabella will, uh, will respect and protect the, the citizens in Granada and others. By that time, on that day, this was the end of the era of the uh, Andalusian uh, civilization and the state. Soon after Abdullah Sagir, Abu Abdullah Sagir left Granada, the process of mass killing and ethnic cleansing started by what we call nowadays Inquisition. Inquisition, which was actually a culture created by the church in Rome at that time. Queen Isabella and her husband Ferdinando or Ferdinand ordered the burning down of more than a million books in the public squares of Granada, not only in Granada, other, other areas in Spain, uh, like uh, Toledo, Zaragoza, Sevilla, and Valencia also suffered from the same, from the inquisition period of burning the treasure of history, the treasure of science and technology, the treasure of culture, the treasure of value and all this, so not because it's for Muslim, it's because for humanity. And this was ordered during the period of the Inquisition uh, controlled by Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand themselves. Ali, can you please uh, move the slide, please? Hello? 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 I cannot move the slide. Ali? Can you remove this box from the middle, please? Thank you. Be with me, huh? Let us talk about the Inquisition period. The Inquisition started by 13th century was 1233 by Pope Greenwar, the ninth in 1233, and its aim was to fight heresy throughout Christian world. What do we mean by heresy? Here is any deviation, even simple one, from the official Christian belief stated by the church. This power of inquisition was given to the clergy in various provinces and regions. 
It was especially active in 15th, 16th centuries, and its mission was to discover and punish the critics of the church. The Inquisition is an, look at this, exceptional, ecclesiastical jurisdiction. Give the power to the clergy to do whatever it is. They burn, they kill, they loot the civilian. Established by Pope Gregory the Ninth to suppress the church offenders throughout the Christian world and to punish perpetrators of heresy, apostasy, and witchcraft, which have been watching this in old black and white movie and even new, new color, full color movie. It was abolished in 19th century, 1834, actually, and replaced by the Holy Council of, for Faith and Faith Affairs in the Vatican nowadays. And the Inquisition was, as mentioned by all the historians, to be considered that one of the most notorious institutions in humanity history, its barbaric activities have been exaggerated to the extent that was said. It claimed the life of 5 million people by some historian, but uh, Mary, uh, Karen Armstrong said only 13,000 people have been killed or been tortured. Between the 5 million and 13,000 people, actually, both of them are extremely, and it should be something in the middle. I don't think it's 5 million, I don't think it's 13,000 uh, people. I cannot move the slide, Ali. Inquisition in Spain. Now, actually, this was the Inquisition coming from Europe, from Rome. The Inquisition in Spain is affiliated with the Holy Court in Spain. It was established by the Catholic King Ferdinand II and Isabella I in 1478 before the fall down of Granada with the approval of Pope Sextus, 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 Sextus IV. Its mission was to preserve the Catholic faith in the Spanish kingdom, kingdoms and to replace the medieval inquisition coming to Rome, which was actually under the papal control from Rome. It was an institution without precedent for similar institution in Europe in the 13th century. The purpose of these courts is primarily to protect the belief of the believers from being converted into Judaism and the Islam or to believe in any other theology and ideology. The movement of the Christian faith have been intensified after royal decrees issued 1492 and 1502 requesting Jews and Muslims this after the fall of uh, Granada to either become Christian or leave Spain. The Inquisition continued until it was finally abolished in 1834 during the reign of Isabella II after its influence had declined in the previous century. So when we look at it, this was while the Arabs in Iraq and Syria and Sham was raising Renaissance, building Renaissance and civilization from the 7th century into the uh, 13th century on the East. And the uh, Andalusian Muslims were building a big civilization from uh, uh, 8th century to about uh, 15th century. The church was suppressing its own people through the Inquisition uh, uh, philosophy of thinking and power. And this is some of the images which you found there, and this has nothing, to, let, let me say, this has nothing whatsoever to do with the proper teaching of Jesus, peace be upon him, or Lady Mary, peace be upon him, or the great, the great, the great Christian priests and vicars and clergy. Nothing to do with them. Moving to the fourth uh, or the fifth point, fourth point, actually, it's burning down Sarajevo in 1992. In the war between Bosnia War 1992 95, Sarajevo, uh, Serbian militia forces burned down Sarajevo library. As Mustafa Yayic mentions, he was the Secretary General of the Library in this reference here, uh, he said that 3 million books have been burned or destroyed. Uh, this could be, can you bring the other one? 
after this period, okay? But they managed to save thousands of books at that time. But this is another example of burning something in the middle of the 20th century in the middle of Europe called Sarajevo. Look at the references at the, at, at the bottom, as well as look at the other talk, which talk your money does not buy you a status as well. And I hope that Ali has added the link of this talk. Next, uh, uh, okay. Uh, now we'll go to uh, point number five, which is historical review. Here are some examples of this brutal atrocity that people have paid dearly. Dearly knowing that these few examples are what have been documented in historical references. And those that have been forgotten and not mentioned in any reference are very, 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 very many. Just to only capture a few. The process of destroying and burning libraries goes back to ancient history. It started with the phenomena of book writing. This was somebody called Lucian uh, Polastron in his book, The Destruction of Libraries and uh, Throughout History. And he mentioned the references there. It seemed, as he said, that all the way through centuries, there was desires to destroy libraries and raise them to the ground. Anti-knowledge, anti-civilization, anti-renaissance, anti-education, anti-learning. As he said, the secret behind that was, it is still, still, it's impossible, he said that, it's impossible, it's impossible to control an educated, literate, and the cultural people. Impossible, that's why, a lot of countries in certain areas, in maybe in the Arab countries or some other countries, are not investing heavily in education, in literacy, in awareness, in civil society, in social services, and they only invest money on security as well as on military to protect their actual uh, establishment. As Lucien said, it's impossible to control and educate uh, 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 to control an educated, literate, and cultured people until we destroy these libraries, the source of knowledge that raise people awareness. Sometimes you could be educated with a PhD, but you are not aware of what's the surrounding. You might not have a culture. You might not be aware. You might not uh, have the knowledge of what's happening in the surrounding. In the surrounding, sorry. And these are some of the examples. It goes back to before, before, before Isa السلام, was born, and Alexander the Great burned the library of uh, Persepolis, Persepolis, and it said that it contained maybe uh, 10,000 manuscripts. The Chinese emperor, Zi Chan Hong, uh, burned all the Chinese scientific and the historical books, and it said that the, the number was uh, 100,000 manuscript. All the books attached to the temple of Apollo in Greece, in Greece were burned. See all, see, see all this before Christ, alayhi salam. Julius Caesar also built uh, 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 Alexandria Library, 48 before uh, PC, and the uh, Roman Emperor Augustus burned all books strange to the Romans. And they came either from India, Tibet, Pharaonic Egypt, and their number was 2000. As it's mentioned, St. Paul ordered the burning of all books in the city of uh, Ephesus, Ephesus, and Emperor Diocletian ordered the burning of all Greek uh, Pharaonic, Pharaonic books Chronic books and manuscripts in, in, in the country. And Emperor uh, Theo, uh, Theodosius, Theodosius, Theodosius burned all the well known libraries in his time, and the number of huge number. Uh, rulers burned books in different parts of the world. The Library of Alexander burned another time in 490 AD. Uh, the mass attacks, uh, the masses attacked the library of Rome 
and destroyed tens of thousands of books as well and manuscript. The Library of Alexandria was burned for the third time in 641. Uh, Leon uh, Izori burned the Byzantine Library, which contained more than half a million books at the time. Uh, seven uh, uh, King uh, Charles Man burned all the pagan manuscripts and references opposing the church, uh, Hulaku or uh, Hulagu, as I mentioned in, uh, about the burning Baghdad and the books of the library in Baghdad. And the Catholic priests uh, burned down most of the libraries in Europe. Uh, the Inquisition, as we mentioned before, burned all the books and references for fear of their negative impact on the people. Archduk Diego de la Nada, de Landa burned all the libraries uh, of ancient Mexico, vice king of Peru, whose name was Francisco Ta Talid, the, the, the Talid, uh, ordered the burning down of all the drawings, drawing, even drawing manuscript, inscription, paintings on the walls of the temples and others in South America civilization that are uh, in, in South America and actually uh, recording the South American civilization that are still mysterious up till now. Uh, 19th century, the Inquisition again, before uh, uh, it was abolished in 19th century, uh, burned all the work of Portuguese genius Gismau, who had manufactured the first aircraft uh, in uh, the recent, not the recent, uh, not the written, uh, Ali, not the written, the recent, in the recent human history, in addition to strange chemistry that he excelled in. Uh, the priest who called Sikar landed in Egypt and went around the country and bought all rare manuscripts from people there and burned them with the intention of eliminating the sciences hostile to the religion. Uh, Napoleon war as well, uh, First World War as well, a second world war as well and so on so on so on so so mankind lost many scientists scientific knowledge scientific books that were discovered and written by brilliant and genius scientists such sciences and scientific knowledge disappeared from the history of humanity and forever unfortunately because the anti-civilization and anti-Renaissance uh, 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 and anti-humanity individual. Now talk about our star of today, which is uh, Pierre uh, Curie, uh, which is number six in our uh, index. What he said, we have 30 books left behind from Muslim Andalusia, only 30 books. So that we could split the atom and you know, with the knowledge in the 30 books, he managed, as he said, as a physicist or top physicist up till now to split the atom. If half of the million of the 1 million burned books could survive, we would already travel between galaxies in space. And if Isabella, and if Ferdinando, and if Holaco in the East did not burn those millions of books of science and technology, as Pierre Curie said, we could have been walking between the galaxies, either by car or walking on foot or by bicycles, building houses, building multi tower building, 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 building. Because we're only living on one dot on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The galaxies, the planets are huge compared with Earth. Thank you, Pierre. May God bless your soul. Also, he said, radium could be very dangerous if it fall in the wrong hands. And it's nowadays falling or fall in the wrong hands. Unfortunately, unfortunately. This was more than centuries ago, a century ago. Who is he? He's a French, born in 1859 in Paris, and considered to be the founding father of modern physics, 
and also a pioneer in the field of studies related to radioactive materials, him and his wife. They won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1903. Uh, the unit of radioactivity was named the Curie, and that was after Pierre Curie excelled in this field. Prior to this, his famous doctoral uh, studies on magnetism, he designed and perfected a highly sensitive tors torsional balance for measuring magnetic parameters. Variations on the equipment were commonly used by future workers in the field. Pierre Curie studied ferromagnetism, parallel magnetism, inversive, inversive magnetism, and for his doctoral thesis and discovered the effect of temperature on magnesium, magnetism, now known as Curie's law. This is a man who is witnessing on your achievement hundreds of years ago and said, if we could have had half of the million books burned only in Andalusia, we could have been walking between galaxies on foot or traveling by cars or whatever you call it at the time. Unfortunately, now we are talking about something else, the barbarians of the age. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. It seemed to me from this review that the antichrist, the anti-humanity, barbaric savages were anti-Renaissance, anti-civilization, anti-literacy, and anti-knowledge. Package. Polanco was not different to the people of nowadays. Even if they were Jesus' code of dress, peace be upon him, and advocate for democracy, liberty, equality, principles of freedom, human rights, and social justice, which is only applicable for them, the citizens of their countries, and the follower of their principles. Those people must be called the barbarians of the age, and human savages and civilized radical extremist and terrorist as well. Let us to search in our society, in our country, in our planet about the barbarians of the age. The barbarians of the age, the barbarians of the age for anti-humanity, anti-society, anti-renaissance, anti-education, anti-knowledge, anti-technology transfer, anti-every anti piece and security and safety for human being. Between the fall of Gortuba in 1236 and the fall of Baghdad in 1258, there was 20 years of darkness. Darkness. Okay? And raising to the ground great humanitarian civilization. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. And the Russia resisted this barbarism for two and a half centuries before the final fall of Granada in 1492 on the hands of European Mongols at the time, Isabella and her husband, Ferdinand. Since then, we are living, listen to this, since that time, the fall of Baghdad in the third century and the fall of Andalusia in the 15th century, sorry, the fall of Baghdad in the 13th century and the fall of uh, Andalusia in the 15th century, since then, since then, actually, we are living inside the darkness and absences of injustice, tyranny, anonymity, impoverishment, misleading, legalized corruption, stealing of assets and resources, falsifying nation's history, blurring and manipulating civilization's landmark. This is what we are living for the, la in, 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 for the last five centuries that we are living now. We talked about all these problems. The final is what's the way forward? What is our way forward? What is our way forward? Five priorities to deal with and another four points. Priority number one, investment in education and learning in all different kinds of traditional and non-traditional education. Investing in education and learning. Investing in education and learning, number one. Number two, 
priority investing investment in raising community knowledge and social awareness raising community knowledge and system uh, system uh, uh, social awareness and uh, this will be through public building public libraries uh, reading spaces inside government and departments and institutions and encouraging people to do that. Number three, investment in building strong civil society sector and effective civil society organization com and, and completing the building process of a state and institution to protect civil liberty and space and ensuring the citizen's right in the shade of the state of law, equality, and social justice. Three priority, education, learning, uh, social awareness, and civil society sector and organization. Number four and the priority, investment in fighting corruption. We are living in a very corrupt world, controlled by corrupt government, controlled by corrupt leaders, and corruption become a system as a law to protect corruption and save corruption. Prioritizing the investment in fighting corruption and unemployment, because corruption leads to unemployment. Through encouraging manual work, come back to the basics, come back to basic manual work, and pioneering handicrafts professions, and widely spreading the culture of establishing community markets industry. Priority number five, investment in agriculture, because we are all farmers, it's the simplest profession to start to cultivate the land and make land reclamation uh, and others. Prioritizing the investment in agricultural field, land reclamation and livestock farming and industry. Those five priorities, those five priorities. Number six, talk about the history and the values and the culture, rewriting and editing nation's culture, values and history. History should be written by the citizens who lived through its path in different villages, townships, cities, districts, and governments, and not to be written by one group or one party. Well, nowadays, what we are having, one individual is writing the history of everyone. Absolutely wrong. Fight and stand up for knowing your history, knowing your past, knowing your culture, knowing your value, knowing your religion and collectively make encyclopedia historica for yourself and your country and your nation. Number seven, ensuring the independence of what? Of all the state institutions from the uh, encroachment of government officers and executives. State institution has to be independent because it is role with the civil society organization is to monitor and regulate the government and it is officers and its executives. Ensuring the independence of, the, of all the state institution from the encroachment of the government and its executives and empowering them to monitor and regulate the government performance. They have to be the watchdog on the president, the prime minister, the emir, the sheikh, the king, the queen, and, 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 and. Number eight, which is extremely important, I should have put it in the top priorities. Prohibition, absolute prohibition of the military and the security from being engaged in civilian work. From being engaged in civilian work. Civilian work has to be done by civilian people, by the citizens of the country, not by the military, not by the security. Because both these institutions should, have be, should be made independent for their sacred role and their sacred message. The secrecy of their sacred role is to protect the country and they die for the country as martyrs or to protect the citizen and they die protecting the citizen as martyrs. Once you start to engage in civil work, and businesses and construction and all this sort of thing, they lost their secrecy and they become one of the wick, most wicked system in the country, which is destroy the economy and destroy the social life of the country and the economic life of the country and the political life of the country because they have the guns and they can shoot to kill. 
This means that the civil president, the civilian executive government, the military and security forces, and the other government personnel are what? Servants and employees before the citizen of the country. We pay from our tax their salaries. We pay from our tax the arm and armament that they have. So, so they should not be engaged in the civil life because the mission is sacred. Number nine, ensuring the independence of parliamentary, trade union, judiciary, leg legislative, legal, constitutional, informational, media uh, circles and uh, organization and institution from the encroachment of the executive government. Don't ever let the government to be in control of those. They have to be independent. So from the government, so they can actually monitor and regulate the performance of the government, government as well as the state institution, as well as the civil society organization. These are a lot of references here, and I hope that Mahar has already, sorry, not Mahar, Ali has already added uh, to you uh, uh, the link of the other talk. And I'd like to take this opportunity. Can we let the slide to work back again? And I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to thank you very much for being patient to go with me through the history and to talk about uh, the witness of Pierre Curie uh, God, may God bless his soul, who said that only with 30 books we managed to split the atom and have all our industry. But if we could have uh, received half of the million books who have been destroyed in, uh, by Isabella and her husband, Ferdinando, by actually what we call it, the, the barbarians of the age, the barbarians of the age, the barbarians of the age, who could have been walking among the galaxies. God bless you. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We'll see you next week in another uh, lecture, inshallah. Well, I thank my colleague, Ahmed al-Sheikh, and I show you their faces again, and uh, Ali Shawa. And I believe that I can get help from people like them, uh, whether they are male or female, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.